It was an announcement that surprised many. Yeah. The Baltimore's top prosecutor uh, has decided to charge the six police officers in the death of Freddie Gray, a death which has been ruled a homicide. Now we're joined by Professor Byron Warnkin from the University of Baltimore School of Law. Thanks for being here. I'm happy to be here. All right, so I guess th there are a lot of questions, but, but one must wonder if all of these cases will be tried together or will they be separated, will they be severed? Typically, if you've got multiple defendants who come out of the same incident, usually they start by charging them, prosecuting them together. My suspicion would be that's what the state's attorney's office will do. If that's what happens, my suspicion would be that one or more of them would try to have their case severed from the other cases. Does, when does the plea bargaining begin, or will it in this case? We had heard some uh, people on the street, some of the demonstrators saying, don't let them plea bargain mm -hmm. in uh, this case. They want to see them go to court and, and face a judge. What, what's the process? I, I think that in virtually every criminal case, there are discussions between the prosecutor's office and the defense counsel. Um, no competent lawyer on either side would say, I'm not even going to talk to you. They're going to talk, they're going to find out whether there's any play here, any move. And what I don't know, and I don't guess you don't know, is how much do they need the testimony of one or more of mm. them in order to make their case. That's what you had been watching. And we today. don't know, yeah. we don't know what they gave in their statements. Apparently five of the six gave statements. And was my statement, yes, I'm guilty, or was my statement, she was the one that was guilty? You know, mm -hmm. who knows? What kind of fight are you expecting over the debate of whether this case can be tried in Baltimore? I mean, the, where would you move it? The nation's been watching this. Well, at the one end of the spectrum, they say you never need to have a change of venue because the voir dire process where you ask questions of potential jurors it may take a little while, but eventually you can get um, 12 people who have not made a judgment. They may know about the case, but have not made a judgment. By the same, at the same time, the defense side, because of all this media coverage, is probably going to, one or more of them is going to ask, hey, can we get a change of venue, meaning taking it to another county? Something I'd been wondering when we were, um, when the police department had explained only five of the officers had given a statement, everyone wondered why not the sixth, and it's because you can't be, they couldn't be compelled to give a statement, and if they did, it couldn't be used against them in a criminal proceeding. So what happens with sure. that information they've given now? They based on the 1967 Supreme Court case, they could be required to give a statement, but anything they give in that statement could not be used in the criminal case against them. So then we can assume whatever statements these five of the six gave, it, can't, it cannot be used in, these, in the proceedings going forward? Yes. So would we not see them in the charging documents and you know, the, the probable cause statements and that kinds of thing? Well, probably what would happen would be if the state tried to introduce those statements, the defense would object to that and then the court would have to make a ruling. Mm. I want to ask you, we heard a phrase today that, that I had never heard and uh, I'm in a family of attorneys, I'd never heard the phrase depraved heart murder. Yeah, yeah. we thought it sounded like a pot boiler, like a yeah. paper bag. I <laughs> just <laughs> never heard it. It's part of the common law. We mm -hmm. have common law murder and manslaughter in Maryland. Mm -hmm. Depraved heart is in essence, I was not trying to kill you, but in fact I did kill you and the conduct that I used was an extreme disregard for human life. Mm. And uh, we've heard uh, Jane Miller, a lead investigative reporter, uh, talk about how surprised she was about with the two who were charged with false imprisonment. Um, I'm wondering, it really sent a message, she believes, from Marilyn Mosby was sending a message, and it does send a message about some old policing practices here in the city of Baltimore. Uh, what do you make of, of those specific charges? Well, in, in the realm of things, the false imprisonment is a misdemeanor and is a lot lower than all the others. But yes, if I put someone in my control, if I'm a police officer and I put someone in my control, um, then it could be a false imprisonment. And I guess in this case, it's based upon the fact that the state's attorney has made a decision based on her investigation, the, the police department's investigation, that there was not a basis to arrest these individuals. Mm. If that is so, and that was what Marilyn Mosby said today, then in fact, if that's correct, then it would be falsely imprisoning someone to arrest them. All right. Professor, thank you. You're welcome. Helping us understand the process. We appreciate it. Happy to do so.